mention about the power purchase agreement on Lanai, but he said, you know, all I want you to do is be fair. And he said that because I have a sister and a sister-in-law that's for the wind project. I have two brothers against him, and I have one brother on the fence. <laughs> So again, just to, um, this is called the fish bowl. We are the fish you're looking at in the bowl. And so the idea is that the audience, like, you know, you watch the fish in the fish bowl, you watch it, you see what's going on. Um, and so if you want to be part of the fish bowl conversation, anybody can come up here at any time. Wait, can we only talk to other people inside the fish bowl? Yes, oh, you can okay. only talk because we're in a fish bowl. Okay. <laughs> so if, if people, so if people want, if we say something and you want to respond, you can come up here. There's an empty seat. Kahali might take it, but I don't know if she's really gonna say anything <laughs> regarding wind energy. Go ahead. This is an open forum, so again, you know, I know this is a new idea, so I'm trying to malama this idea in Hawaii. So this is called a fishbowl, um, and so I'll start it off. Mahalo everybody for coming to Renewable Energy. Um, and I think I just have the question, maybe to the speakers or whoever is here, how do we, um, how do we mitigate things, I'm just going to go for the throat, um, how do we mitigate things and cultural practices in wind turbine areas because I'm not from wind turbine areas but my research is, my research is based off of Native Hawaiian gathering practices and my goal is to ensure that those things are perpetuated. So I guess my question to anybody that wants to answer it is, how do we mitigate that type of cultural component? Um, and I got nothing to say, so. so you guys can respond to it, or you guys can start on something else. If somebody wants to respond to it, they can come up. Okay. But, yeah. We can. Say okay. um, I'm here to kind of help kick this fishbowl idea off, but I guess um, <clears throat> I wasn't able to catch most of it because I was outside with Kahele, but one thing that I caught was from, um, was it First Wind? And it was like this slide that had one of our, um, one of these kinds of like Hawaiian theoretical concepts of um, Kabama and Kabama Hope. And for me, the issue is not necessarily like what Hawaiian concepts are thrown into um, wind power issues, or if it's not the argument of whether our kupuna would be for it or against it, but where is our place at the table when making decisions that affect our communities? I, I wanted to say that um, I think this is a big Mama. issue. My interest is in geothermal, and I'd love to come back in future meetings and talk, but what is, what is exciting to me um, is something that Helena said about um, making sure that there's one of sensibility in the discussion. I'm so proud of all of you, um, you know, educating yourselves at the university, and I think that we need to talk among ourselves because although we have a business interest and a renewable energy interest in geothermal, our basic philosophy is having our people uh, benefit from our resources and having a say at the table, not just token uh, commentary, but actually in the planning, development, and implementation of that process. And right here in this room, whether we agree or not, and I think this agreement is where we're going to make a better project. I mean, I'd love to go head to head and talk about and hear the 15 sides that people have in this room about the different alternative pieces. But I came up here to, in, I jumped into the fishbowl to say that I am so excited to have, you know, the, the, the knowledge that is in this room and the uh, and, uh, commitment that's in this room that we need to take over that discussion and, and help Hermina, help the people that are, 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 are thinking about us and trying to do um, good for our people and our Aina. And we need to make that discussion. We need to make those decisions. We need to make those pictures. So we'll be back again. Uh, hope to see you all. And, and we need your mana out in everything that we're doing. So mahalo. Thank you.
want to also mahalo everyone for coming tonight as we do. This is just kind of a kickoff of what we hope maybe just an idea that we growing, growing each time. Um, hopefully, I wanted to comment also on our presenters. I think everyone did a great job and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come join us for this conversation. Um, I would like to maybe throw out that, um, you know, um, you know, part of this concept was that we would have folks talking to, you know, we kind of, you know, going to work out some timing issues and whatnot, but also I think in the future, you know, I think, you know, Brother Keiko's presentation and, you know, I really wanted to get to the heart of having cold, hard facts to be presented to our audience, you know, maybe not just simply like, um, not to deter or detract or anything from what we've given, but moving in the future, I hope, you know, you guys agree with me that, um, you know, some things that we're looking for is not just, oh, you know, we would plant this area or, you know, if you planted this area, tell us what you would plant in there and tell us what area that covers and, um, you know, how that incorporates into the rest of the water. And I think our public deserves to have the full story. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the um, kind of the things that we, where we were starting from, because anybody can be invited to any of these type, these kind of talks to listen to the, the party line. Um, I think information is, and access is what we try to do, because we don't have that IK to offer you guys, but hopefully by presenting a connection to those who have the information, then you guys can all go and make decisions for yourselves. And then the only other comment I wanted to make was, um, you know, um, for Representative Marita, I think it was very um, crucial in, in terms of our community's time to have folks like you step up into, you know, those decision-making roles, you know, and um, when it comes down to those Hawaiian sensibilities and those kind of um, more, you know, rounded ways of looking at things, you know, I wanted to ask maybe the room, but in particular those who have Lanahi on their, their minds, you know, um, we're talking about the most equitable way for us to move forward. You know, we're talking about the whole community, we're talking about the Lahui. I mean, because what to me seems most equitable in a Hawaiian sensibility, just one man's opinion, is that, you know, we always told, you know, your moku is your ba'a, right? So when you're generating power on, you know, and this is, you know, for the various your projects. Your moku is your ba'a means your island is your ship. Okay. Um, so, you know, when you're in one community and taking resources to bring over to another community and, you know, here on Oahu, you know, that natural capital, maybe you might be able to argue that those are, the, the Hawaiians have some and have always had some connection to those resources, but to what extent is that power being generated on a different island to be brought here to serve what Jay showed was that, right? Um, and also, you know, how much of that really, I mean, we all play into that, but is it fair and equitable in your words to bring that power <coughs> to serve a community that may or may not represent those necessarily in the Hawaiian sensibility entitled to those resources. Just something to think about. Um, and I see Anela coming up here, so she's just be gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess, did you want to talk? Oh, please, okay, go ahead. Um, I guess to answer that, um, my point of view is that I don't see it feasible. Um, Yesterday, my father and I were driving through Kahala, and it was about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, and the street lights were on from um, on the freeway from Kahala area all the way through New Valley. Is that you know like you gonna harvest energy from the Na'i? Um, and bring it here to power the lights on during the day, you know. And the other thing I wanted to say is, um, thank you, Katie, for sharing that chant that Kapona I wrote. Um, it's 
I'm, I'm also part of the PQ and we've learned it. I, I regret to say that I don't remember it um, that well. Um, but it reminds us that everything has a living force. Every element, as a Hawaiian, we believe that everything has a living force in it. You know, it's, it's not just something that you can um, take at your will, you know. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to say is that the proposed wind project on Lanai um, doesn't really, it would take one turbine to power the entire island. Right now we're, we're powered by a diesel generator that goes out maybe like, you know, once every two, three months. And when it, when, when we have blackouts, it's not for, you know, five minutes and the power's back up. It's for a few hours and then the power comes back up. And then a few hours again and then the power comes back up, you know, so. Um, why not have the Na'i be a model of sustainability? Put up one, two, three turbines, you know? Pump that power into the community. Give the community the benefit. Um, well, first of all, I, just, I had to contemplate, but thank you so much, Katie, for organizing it, and Eric also. Um, I've just briefly met you guys, I think, at the Coral Reef Workshop in Out of Coconut. Um, I, I sort of come to this issue from studying coral reefs and um, knowing the toll that climate change has been taking on the reef and is going to continue taking. Um, so that, that's sort of why I'm interested in renewable energy. Um, it's exciting for me to see these discussions happening um, and what solutions the right chooses moving forward. Um, I'm pretty new to the island, two years. Um, so I, I'm not in a decision-making seat. Um, but whatever solutions I think Hawaii chooses, I think it's very important to, um, to listen to the community and also to be very aware that, um, as Hermina said, that we need to move this forward um, in ways that make sense and that um, there is no business as usual anymore. We, you know, it's not going to happen either. We choose smart solutions moving forward or we, we see the effects of climate change. Thank you so much for everyone for attending and the organizers for putting this on. Yeah. It's an important discussion. I'm glad you um, told me almost taking time, but Auntie Pua is so cool that she's like, oh, let's stay as long as you like. Oh. Right? Because Auntie Pua, she had the, she had the, she had the little deity going on. Um, so, if people want to, maybe the speakers want to respond, or other people want to respond to what was set up here. Um, how you guys think the fishbowl is going? It's kind of a new concept, yeah? <laughs> Called unconferencing. Wikipedia that. <laughs> okay, so this is, this, is what, this is what the vision was, was for researchers and community members to interface on a respectful level because that stuff can get thrown out of the door real quick. Um, and it's just because we're human. It's, you know, it's nothing else. We're just human. But um, mahalo for coming up. And there's an empty seat if anybody else wants to, wants to say something. Um, this is the time to speak, and we don't have any time restrictions at this moment. And we can even take the party outside with the ava after we're done parlaying in here. Mahalo for staying. I guess I'm sitting in a seat because I'm a community person before Public Utilities Commission. We intervened in 30 dockets in the last 15 years. And sit on the Public Utilities Commission Reliability Standards Working Group. So it's important to get community voices into PUC decisions uh, and to counter just having only industry there. Because as Mina said, the decisions, they have a very important role in balancing cost and in balancing the different renewable options. And it's important to get as many voices to the table as possible so that they can make the wisest and most reasonable decisions in all of our interests. Papa, can you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Henry Curtis, um, Executive Director of Life of the Land. 
Sorry, I forgot. Thanks. Okay. I, I just wanted to make two points. Um, in the environmental review process, it, it's really important to participate. And there are a lot of smart people in this room in, that can ask key questions in when the docu documents are being formulated. And this is supposed to be a disclosure document uh, on the project. So, you know, a lot of you who are researchers um, that have background in, answer, in asking key, key questions should be participating in the EIS process. Um, the second point that I wanted to make is um, what I'm seeing out in, um, for example, when I go to the legislature to talk to legislators there, what I'm hearing in the community community is really frightening me because you may have people on the neighbor islands say, saying please don't take our resources why should you why should we send our power to Oahu and what I'm hearing on Oahu is well we're tired of subsidizing you you know how do you expect to um, create your uh, um, these needs on your island when when the tax base is on Oahu and we send our money to you. So I see that as a real degeneration in, in, in the conversation of how we act as a community, how we work together as a community. And um, so we, okay, uh, that's all I can say, it, it scares me the, the direction that the conversation is going, it's us against them. I, um, so a couple of things. I, I was uh, I was first asked. Uh, I was asked if I could come present HNEI's position on these things. I guess I want to make clear our it was an institute and as an individual we don't we were asked to do studies, we do research, but we're not I mean, we don't advocate certain projects um, or even certain technologies. So it's not I'm trying to make sure I'm not up here pushing certain projects. I mean, we're asked to, if we do something, what are the effects? And that hopefully that information can enter into the, the, the discussion. We can talk about if we do do these projects, one versus another, what what are the effects, how much oil do we save doing this? What are the effects here? So I, that's part of our role. Um, one of the graphs I used was to hopefully, I mean, it made the point that I was hoping. I mean, we show the, I mean, the issue is our demand for energy here on Oahu. I mean, that's, that's driving this discussion and how to, uh, I mean, that's where the discussion is for potentially importing energy here. And I, I agree that the, the conversation of, we take it too much for granted that we turn the lights on here and the lights turn on and that all happens. Same point, uh, all of the points we've made, that discussion is a, it's a global discussion. We, we've got to keep in mind that the oil we're importing for all of us here in the state is coming from somewhere else in the world that's been drilled in somebody's community there. They don't have a voice in those decisions here. So it's, it's a bigger context of the discussion we're having. And the same points can be raised broadly. So I, I think that's, that's part of the impetus for why we want to look at, at local resources so that we're not part of that chain here. Um, how that is solved within the state, I think, is, is a critical discussion. What I wanted to put out. Hi, I'm Kat Brady. I'm with Life of the Land, and I'm a justice advocate. So I think um, one of the questions that we should be asking is: Do we think all the islands should be linked, or should each island be energy independent? And that's never been a discussion that we've had in the community. So I think we're sort of. Um, that's my question. <laughs> You know, should we be having that discussion, 
or should each island be energy independent? We keep hearing about shared sacrifice, but you know, you can't really bring a case to court unless you've exhausted all your administrative remedies. So have we actually looked into every kind of energy that we could have on Oahu and to be energy self-sufficient? I don't know the answer, but I think we should be talking about it. I, I want to thank you for um, the, the points that you just made. Uh, I, I see the issue um, from several different perspectives. And one of, one of those perspectives is the fact, or, or the, the feeling of aloha aina, um, a love for the land, a love for the place that we call home, and a respect for the land. Um, our, our ancestors, you know, they believe that the land is the chief, man is his servant, is the servant. And so it's, it's our responsibility to care for the land. And what I see on Lanai and what I, what I hear on Lanai is this, this um, I, I'm very emotional about this. And, and I ask you to forgive me for this, but what I see is um, one landowner saying, well, I'm going to do it, you know, because this is going to, this is going to make a profit for me um, on a losing, you know, basically the Castle and Cook, who is owned by Mr. Murdoch, basically he purchased the island thinking that he was going to make millions off of the island, and that is not come to pass, and so now the new thing is to buy into this energy thing, um, you know, and I believe in alternative energy when, when um, never mind, never mind what that means, but I, tr I truly do, and have looked at many of the different options that are available. But we, on Lanai, this whole thing has, in addition to being an issue of, of you know, we're giving our resources to Oahu, and what do we gain from it? Because, for instance, do you know that if you rent a home from Castle and Cook, I, and you know I haven't lived there in a year and a half for various reasons, but Lanai is our home. But when I left Lanai, if you rented a home from Castle and Cook, um, you couldn't hang your clothes in the yard. Mm -hmm. Hawaiian homes too. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, anyway. So it, it's a, for me, but, but the, other, the other thing, besides the fact that this is our, our home, our land, and, and is this best use of this land? The other thing is, on Lanai, it has become an issue of social justice. What you're talking about. You know, we're taking the, we are taking the oil from these places, and those people have very little say in the removal of their resource to feed our, our needs. Well, it's also a social justice issue on the night. Where is the justice? You know, Mina told you she has a family on both sides of the fence. Well, not only on both sides of the fence, also on the fence, <laughs> you know, and, and that's the way it is. I know of I was vice principal at Lanai High in Elementary School for quite a while. And many of my students, um, they email me and they say, I don't know what to do. You know, my parents work for the company, we live in their house. I know what's happening is wrong, but my parents are holding the signs because they want jobs, because they need jobs. And so it's really become a dividing force within the community. And, and how do you, how do you reconcile with something like that? It's, it's very, very difficult. So for me, the, the social justice aspect um, is huge right now. Even larger, I think, than 
whether or not we should put windmills and that cable. That, that, that social justice is just, it's tearing me apart. I'm an engineering student, PhD in civil environmental engineering. I am from Wet'enai. I do relate with you I to, from coming from a region where we too um, suffer social injustices with having carrying the weight for Oahu's garbage. And then gonna carry away again with Oahu's garbage. Um, it's interesting how they like to change the name. Why Manolo Do you think why Manolo Gold is Oh hey, it's what <coughs> That's a whole other separate issue. What um what was asked, what does it mean to be energy efficient? That's what I would like to question. When you talk about sustainability, what sustainability? You know, I there's sustainability, at least in the 2050 plan um, vision that was brought out by the state is um, meeting the needs of today without affecting the needs of future generations. Okay, so what kind of time frames that are we thinking about? You know, kahiko, mamua, right? Kahiko, they thought differently. And then at this present day of time, we think differently. Because there is huli, you know, how huli, there's times of change. You know, we shifted from the very beginning, 1778, February, it's coming up, you know, November, um, that's when Captain Cook rediscovered, you know, these islands. And then by that time in 1819, 1810, we were united as a kingdom. I mean, not, well, by Kamehameha Nui, he passed away 1819, 1824. It changes the Ikaku system. You know, 1843, that's when we became a country, November 28th, the law of Hui Hawaii, um, thanks to our predecessors, 1893, annexation, then different government changes, 1959, a supposed state. That's still up in the air. Um, now it's 2012. You know, that's different time changes. What do you mean by sustainability is what I ask because are we, if you want to achieve those objectives by 2030, 2050, 2100, it takes us, the constituents, to change our behaviors and we know that and the question is from a, a policy, I'm an engineer, I'm building those things. You know, sometimes I was just talking to a friend who works and I won't say where, but someplace either for state or county government and say, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm working over here, I'm telling the politicians that this is not efficient. But no, go, oh, we get the money from federal government. Oh, we get the money. I just want to show to my constituents that I'm making something better for the island. But is that really better? You come to these islands, they came from these islands, and then now it's us, you know, assimilating into a different culture. I've assimilated fully, or is it? That's a question. Uh, or am I walking, people say different worlds, but for me it's one world, different systems. But what is it that it means by efficient? Because for me, I want to live and breathe the aina. Oha aina. Hanauka aina, hanauke ali, hanauke kanaka. You know, first was born the land, then the chiefs, then the people. It's olono eao, thank you for your anti -mary. Ben of Bukui, he wrote in 1984, at least it was published in 1983, and those whoever shared that to her, you know, that transfer of knowledge um, is now the time. Like, who is going to do it? Does the intent change? You know, these are just questions that I'm trying to sift through in my head, and this is what tries to come out. I am an emotional person too, just how I am, but at the same time, I feel, you know, let me. I don't understand, you know, sometimes I don't feel like I'm able to speak freely, even at this institution, because I understand the repercussions of me speaking. How do you protect a person's identity so that they can speak freely on a matter 
and the free flow of exchange of ideas to have an effective, informed, best decision for the whole community. That's on the plate right now. For Filanai and for other islands, you know, geothermal in Hawaii, Moku, Puni or Hawaii, Moku, Keawe, or you know, in Lanai, in Maui, you know, these things are popping up. I understand that you guys tell us to go make comments. For me, sometimes I can't even make it the deadline for the comment because I never knew the thing would happen. Like questions, where is a consolidated place in the legislature that I can go to? You know, like I'm a Facebooker or I'm a Twitter or I'm whatever. You know, there's the newspaper, but like streamlining things. What, is the, what does efficient mean? That's just what I come to leave and put that seat in. But I really appreciate you folks listening and coming and bringing forth and puka this discussion. Paul. Um, I'm Cindy Lowry, and I, I'm, I lived in um, Cross this Park in 1970. All my neighbors, I had 10 immediate neighbors, just graduated from camp school. And they're all still very close friends of mine from all the islands. And um, when I moved out to Makaha, and um, Margaret Apo was my mentor, and, um, I, I decided that long ago that I would spend my career in energy, economics, and environment. And I'm still there. And I had a 100-page chapter on global climate change and accelerated sea level rise in 1979 mm -hmm. as a graduate student at Eastwood Center in the energy program. I did my doctorate in um, energy and environment uh, policy. And and I did 10 years of, I went to Fiji for my field work and I spent 10 years down there. I worked in all, all the Pacific Island countries for the UN. And I worked in more than 20 developing countries in Asia for USAID. But I'm back. And I had 41 years to think about this stuff. And, um, I, the comment that tonight handing it that you don't think DG can make it, that it has to be the central stuff. I, I'm, I'm becoming very encouraged. Um, I've been spending the last seven months I've worked on it for APEC on a, a report on the green building rating programs for all economies in APEC. And especially, I, they hired me because of an energy expert and I've spent you know, all these seven months, chewing ch through every every line item about energy efficiency and off-site renewable, on-site renewable, transportation options. And every every economy puts the points for those three things. Higher, higher, higher. Some countries make sixty percent of all the points of being green, building on those three things, and that will keep going. So. So then there's another thing that's coming out. Ma many countries, these are the smartest people on the international standards, people from Japan, from Korea, from US, from um, Malaysia, from many countries. But they are all coming into this smart, they call it smart um, building, a smart grid, a smart um, uh, transportation and smart jobs. And so I'm writing, I, I'm finishing this week in fact, uh, almost 200 pages now, but, but it's, there's a, a smart rating system now and how it, it gets smarter and smarter in, in that um, in order to, to find the, the, the intersection of preserving the very precious fine culture but using some of those smart technologies and, and showing that every island can be 100% off of fossil fuels. And a Molokai could do it with a few turbines and, the, and the, some more solar and so on in a very short order. Um, Molokai would be first and Molokai could also do it very easily. The technologies that it takes, as Kiko said, some, some more storage. Um, and that you, you know, 
Big Adam has the ace in the hole. That's all that geothermal. That's the firm. That's 24-7. That's 100% displaced fossil. But, but the, we have these issues that the grids, the smart grids, the big grids, they have this 15% you know, um, wall here. The projects can't get in. And so, so we never get that percentage of renewable up very high. So where it's coming now is the intersection of, you have a green building that it has, can, how much, as with the high rise, how many panels can put on the roof and be green? Oh, that's, that's insignificant. But if it could get a lot of green power off-site, then it could get to 100% the points that for that green building, but it's blocked now. It can't come in. So the reason it can't come in because it has to be it has to go somewhere immediately when it comes for the wind park. If if it's going into a a giant parking structure in that building full of electric vehicles and it's immediately stored in the in the, in the transportation sector, then then the, the excuse that only 15% can come in is gone. And 100% can come in from the wind farm or from whatever is there. It all has a place to go and stay and, and serve. That becomes a, a micro spot to, to work on supply and demand. And this, this is a micro grid now. Not, a, not, the, not the grid where all the Christmas lights are on, on electric trees, but these are community trees now. And so the, the, the whole APEC, these very smart people I run into in these, these APEC meetings on standards and conformity assessment models um, from all these countries, they talk about smart communities and, and smart cities and smart urban development, smart, smart rural development. It's, 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 the, it's the community level that is smart and, and it's intersecting all the sectors in a way that you go around this, this, this big smart central monopoly situation and you, you, you use the distributed regenerative, you have so much redundancy in these small smart micro grids that the, the, the way that when you have a co-located smart building with a co-located smart transportation options and then you have around that a, a smart micro grid and then you have all those non-firm renewables can come in and have a place to store it and and the, the transportation system then is going off fossil fuels as well as the building. Buildings are on the average globally 40% of all the use of fossil fuels and a lot of the rest is the transport. You work on those two synergistically in one, in one concept but you solve these other sectors as well. You got four sectors at least going into one concentric process. So there's these technologies that are People are demoing them in other places, not yet here, the microgrid. But if, if, if some of those, this technology could go into, a, well, not even, more cut even, but take the small islands first, and big islands could go to 100% very quickly as well. I've been working with them. They have, they have the PowerPoints from, from the Japanese hosted the, these, all these smart, grid, smart microgrid. Japan has got islands going with smart microgrids already. And you know, Korea, um, tai, tai, Taipei, a lot of countries are ready to run with this. Our country will be, is, is not going very fast compared to the rest. You know, the, the, but the technologies are coming out and they want to demo it and they always want to demo it on a small island. And a lot of them don't have the small islands to demo it on. So, if someone was, you know, step up at the plate, if, if you know, these people are out there looking for places to, to try this all out, but they want it to be community-based. You want your solutions community-based, they want to try it out that way. Those, these, these matchmaking opportunities exist. You know, and, and so somehow to take the Manao from, that was 100% self-reliant on the island in the past, but now people want their iPhone and they want the electricity. So you have to figure out how that one can be, the two can come together in a way that works. And so I, I feel more and more hopeful after all 41 years now that it really can, it 
can come together. And I think these islands can be a place to show the rest of the world that how a community, you have the Ohana, the community that nowhere else in the planet I have seen it so function so beautifully, um, how, how it can work. Um, I, I think you can get there first. And, and if you, you'll give the whole region a gift if you, if you can um, get the engineers. <laughs> as well, you need all your engineers. You need your economists, you need your lawyers, like Mike Talipi and so on. You, you need to put all those talents on, on this big project. You know, whatever your passion and your talent is, there's a place for it. But um, it's, it, you know, I have 10 engineers in my immediate family, you know, several of them are working on this market at the University of Washington where I can go. You know, they're, 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 there's a lot of people coming to this urgent need to, in, in one, oh, one moment, we're saving money, we're saving emissions, we're, we're, we're you're doing 10 very, same, all positive things, all of one, one set of actions. But, it's putting them all in a nexus where you see they can, none, none of this can be solved one in one sector at a time. They all have to come together. But you people can do that. I'm sh I really confident you can. And I'm pleased to see this, this uh, room. I did all my graduate work in UH, but it was almost 40, 30 years ago. I've, I feel wonderful to see you convening this and this So thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Aurora, did you want to add something because you've been waiting patiently? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I one thing, one thing. we got to be out of here in about 10 minutes, so if you can take ball it up. And um, Paula might have cleared anybody off, but hopefully this won't be our first and last one. Right. <laughs> Maybe. But you guys can, um, if you guys want to give your points, and then we got to help while I'm outside. But you guys can finish off what you guys want to say. I hope at one point that this group takes up the idea of smart grid because smart grid as it's being proposed is that multi multinationals from some of the largest and most powerful com com companies in the world are looking to spend billions of dollars to build a highly centralized system that will cost an arm and a leg and ensure their survival for all eternity and the alternative is communities doing their own thing. The Hawaiians, when they were in command here, did not need multinational corporations from Japan, <laughs> India, and the mainland United States coming here and telling them how to be sustainable. They did it themselves. And the idea that we now need multinationals to explain to us why we need to give them billions of dollars building smart grids is not the solution. And I hope that debate occurs at some point. Micro. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would have to sit here if you asked something. <laughs> Get into the bowl. <laughs> so you want to to it, but, um, I, I wanted to respond to, um, I'm sorry to catch your name, Empty. Empty Martha. Empty Martha. Martha and, and Anella. Anella. Um, because of my, I mean, I've been watching water a lot more than energy for most of my educational career. I mean, it seems like a lot of the things that you guys are seeing are very similar, the arguments about water and how, um, you know, during sugar times, water was moved out of where it belonged, and it's, it's, to me, it's the same, it's the same, and so my question, I pose is, is there something we can learn from, positive, that we can learn from those experiences, even if it's not energy, on how to address them, these questions productively, um, innovatively, um, and, and, you know, I, I mean, catching in again, but she has experience from other other places outside of Hawaii, and I, mean, I know, you know, this kinds of this kinds of social justice. It is a social justice issue. It's not about energy. It's about who owns the land and who controls mm -hmm. what happens there. Because in Hawaii, our small state. I mean, I I lived in Hawaii. I saw the same thing. The plantation closed, but the but the Luna was still there. People could not speak out about you know. It was, in that case, it was the public school because they would lose their jobs and have to move. So, um, but there must be ways that we can learn from other examples, even if it's not energy, but if it's water, if it's, if it's other commodities. So I, I'm hoping that this kind of discussion will bring to light some of those, and I'll be thinking about it, because I didn't even know that that was the situation. For them. So, thank you. And 
and oh wait, can I make one more plug? I feel credentialed to say this because I went to MIT. <laughs> Technology is not always the solution. I mean, I, I went to school for that and I found that there are a lot of answers to things, but we look to technology to be the answer. And in, in often cases, it consolidates power into that. Um, but those who can't, who can afford to own the technology. So there are a lot of other managed technology is part of the solution, but it's not the only thing. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I just thought I would first initially quickly mahalo everybody for being respectful and um, allowing everybody to deliver their mana'o. Know, un uninterrupted, find that not to be the case in a lot of conversations you have on a day to day. Um, moving forward, I um, uh, just thought initially that maybe, um, you know, bringing together what some of the other questioners and discussions have brought up, I think that sometimes, you know, uh, how should I put this? In terms of you know the conflicts that we see in our community, you know sometimes it's symptomatic of um, what you know you could maybe characterize as an assimilation debt, where you know on the one hand we are facing issues that are way beyond our boundaries: global climate change, marine debris. I mean, even if we got all of our act together, that still would come to us. So we are facing issues today that our kupunas could not have even fathomed. So that is why, you know, a way forward is gonna have to involve science. And, and, and I hope that's, just to kind of draw it back to why we're all here. The, um, so given that, you know, um, I guess the question I will continue to pose is, um, you know, at what cost are we willing because we've, in, in this assimilation debt that we've incurred, like we've already lost a lot of the knowledge which we probably wish we had now, um, in terms of being able to at least live sustainably, not always in harmony and not always in perfect balance with you know the Aina, but it was working. So that knowledge, having that now, losing that as a result. I mean, what are the costs, I guess, like, ultimately, you know? I mean, the standard of living for the average Hawaiian today, the commoner, is increased, but at what cost? And this is something that sometimes I find myself thinking about in my day-to-day. -day. Thank you, Eric. Do you folks to have something quickly to say? I just quickly wanted to um, listen to what the um, people of Lanai wanted to say. What are some solutions that they like to see in their communities. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet many people from one night, so I, I really would like to, um, maybe if you guys are staying, to just listen um, to what you would be interested in seeing, what the future would bring for renewable energy and, and solutions, um, just to, to hear. I would like to hear. Thank you. Would you like to know? Well, it's quick. Um, I'm fortunate that I get to work on these things for a living. And when I, and from technical perspective, when I look at what we're trying to do in the state here, technically the issues are solvable. There are technologies out there to do certain things. So the, where we go, it's more of a question, these social community issues, how, how will we choose what we think are, are the right paths? Each island is a state, and when, when you guys first approached me, and we don't have enough forums like this to discuss these issues, and that's why I wanted to, to come and make sure to participate, because the generally decision making is, it's, it's, it's not, you're not in conversational forums where these types of issues are talked about and um, debated, and so I don't, I don't know the answer how to foster that more. Um, but I know that that's, there, there are hard choices to make, and so the extent that we have more forms like this, I only want to support it. Thank you. That's a really good point where we could just close this discussion at this time. Yes. So um, 
of having um, an open forum discussion. This is the first of its kind for our group for Hawaiian Island Science. Um, if you have any further questions, we're going to take this discussion outside if you guys want to continue with it. Um, I just want to thank you folks. I want to thank um, Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our email list is outside, and I don't know how many Facebookers are in here, but we're on Facebook too. Hawaiian Island Science, High Side. Um, yeah, so we have an email list, and um, maybe we'll do this once a month. Uh, we'll see. Uh, right? But we do need help coordinating future ones, so if you guys have friends, that are dealing with issues that you feel are critical to Hawaii, that's kind of our platform, right? So, um, and if you've seen by our presenters, it's an array. We got researchers, we got government, we got private businesses, community members, and that's really the constituency that we're trying to reach out, basically everybody on the island, which can't fit in this room, but it doesn't mean the forum can't grow or, um, the goal isn't for this to be the only one, but for this to be developed on each island. Um, that's kind of the goal. And there is a need for that. Our very first meeting, actually, that happened in the bar, somebody flew from Hawaii Island to come to our meeting. So, on, on her way to Hawaii, of course. Um, so, there is a need, high Aina, island wide, for this. So, please share with your friends if you guys have suggestions of what you want to hear. There's a umeke outside next to the avo. You can write your suggestions down. Better yet, a suggestion with a contact information would be facilitated. But um, yeah, we can talk story outside for sure. There's a little bit more fruit, a lot of spiced water out there, lemon, lime, and mint, and then a little bit more avo. So thank you guys for coming and spending an hour over what we projected to be doing. So yeah, there's no talk story without community. So thank you guys. Mahalo yang